the, the AI Award, which you can't have missed, um, which launched on Tuesday. Uh, a bit more about supporting people at home. Um, the work we've been doing on a digital health technology assessment uh, criteria. And then finally, um, ask for your help in mapping the RPA landscape. Great. So um, I won't talk a great deal about the award itself. We're going to hear more um, about it from Lord Bethel. But I've, oh, sorry, next slide, please, Kieran. Um, I did want to just highlight the kind of range of different examples that have done well um, from this award. Um, just rolling back in time, uh, it was almost exactly a year ago that the AI Lab was announced. Um, and there was a real commitment within that, both to take the best and strongest ideas that we're using machine learning and AI in research and get them into the hands of patients and clinicians. Uh, and the reason I'm so excited about where we are now is that this is now happening. So 42 uh, companies were granted an AI award um, and it's all part of seeking to become a real world leader in the use of this in healthcare. So just to give some examples um, of the winners in the kind of scaling category. So these are these are mature technologies that are ready to be scaled more generally. Um, Healthy IO, that is uh, a technology that turns uh, a smartphone into a clinical grade diagnostic tool. It's able to spot signs of uh, chronic kidney disease in urine samples, and it can really help patients with diabetes not have complications. Irhythm Technologies have a wearable ECG monitoring patch, which is fantastic for picking up difficult to diagnose diseases like atrial fibrillation. And Brainomics um, have been using the brain scans to help um, more quickly process uh, emergency stroke patients in a number of sites, and this will help them scale further. On the next slide, I talk about um, some of the uh, companies that are at earlier stage. They are starting their first real world test. Uh, Chiron, um, which is a British um, brain cancer scan company um, that's been doing great work uh, up in um, the Midlands um, with a big consortium there, trying to improve the accuracy of, um, of scanning for breast cancer. Ibex, which does a similar thing, but for prostate biopsy slides. Um, and Echo, which is a smart stethoscope that also records an ECG while it's doing that. This is getting great feedback um, from primary care colleagues at the moment. Um, and then finally, Oxford Heartbeat, which um, helps around high risk brain surgery. And I think just looking across those examples, it gives a hint of the, uh, the real depth and breadth of these innovations and how they can make a really practical difference to patients on the ground. So we're delighted at NHSX that we are able to be part, um, working with a whole bunch of other partners such as NIH, NHI, N <laughs> NIHR and the AAC um, in awarding these really important critical bits of pump priming to get these products out to more people. Um, and what's next for the AI lab is that um, we've also recently on the next slide, um, we've put out a comprehensive buyer's guide to AI to help people who are purchasing uh, these tools, including the top 10 questions that commissioners need to ask. We'll be having a, an event if people would like to know more about the AI award on Thursday, the 24th of September. You'd be most welcome to attend that. Um, and uh, if you'd like to read more about the work and find out about how to um, get more involved, please look on our uh, specific web pages on the NHSX website, which say a great deal more than I will be able to in my few minutes. Um, on the next slide, I move on to supporting people at home. So this is a really important part of our joining up care work. Uh, um, so on the slide, it talks about three sections. I'm going to talk about the middle bit about supporting people at home. Um, next slide, please, Kieran. And last time we mentioned that the, we would have this focus on joining up care, that we wanted to make the most of this big shift to digital health um, services that has also impacted um, care homes during the pandemic and hold on to those gains and build on them. So we're partnering with regional teams to scale digital innovations that enable remote monitoring to better support people manage their own care from home. So very linked to our citizen facing goals at NHSX. And what we've been doing since we last met is that teams across regions have been working with those, their localities to select those priorities that chime with their particular needs in, in their patch um, and to bid to us for implementation funding to support that. As many of us know, often it's not the technology that's the tricky bit, it's the change management to make the most of it. So based on that evidence, this is our approach. 
Um, so regional teams have been completing bids and pitched to a panel of NHSX uh, teams um, chaired by Matthew just a few weeks ago. And I'm delighted that all bids have been supported and the schemes are kicking off this month. And we're at the final stages of evaluation of a new um, dynamic purchasing system, Spark DPS, in support of remote care. Uh, and us having done a very detailed evaluation nationally will really help uh, NHS and social care organisations select digital products. Selection can then happen quite compliantly within about three weeks rather than three to six months. Um, and uh, it, it, the next slide sort of just shows this as a bit of a jigsaw, the four components. So there's the regional scale plans that I, sorry, next slide please, Kieran. Um, there's the regional scale plans I just mentioned. Um, there's the simplifying access to solutions, which is the procurement uh, exercise, but also we've um, been successful in bidding for some COVID monies to help support um, for this year only license costs as well. The third component is the innovation collaboratives. Um, so we're putting support mechanisms in for these groups of adopters. We're building a community of practice. We're sharing resources. We're doing everything we can to try and help accelerate spread. Um, we ran a big event on Tuesday um, for people who wanted to uh, learn about the virtual ward for COVID monitoring um, and would like to put that in place themselves. Um, and we will be giving support to local systems consistently. And then the fourth dimension is about the digital outpatient pathway. Um, work to really reimagine outpatient pathways to be digitally supported. Um, significant involvement from key stakeholders such as the Royal Colleges and the clinical directors and looking at the very ultra high volume specialties. Uh, and if you'd be interested in finding out more about this, there's a specific workshop on it later. And there's also one on procurement as well, if that is more your bag. Next slide, please. So just to finish off on um, remote, I think I might, I think I might have missed my Derek chap. Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, Implementation teams, we'll, we'll be reinforcing local teams with the staff that they need and running those innovation collaboratives we spoke about. Um, and given that for over 400,000 people, their home is a care home, we are also looking at strongly supporting care home residents through digital health tools, which is a particularly exciting development. Um, we are very soon going to start communicating the patient benefits of remote monitoring. That work's going to kick off next week, so do look out for it. Next slide, please. So um, we talked about this a bit last time, but just to recap, because conscious that not everybody will have been part of this journey with us, but um, we, uh, we had a really strong message from the marketplace that the existing approach didn't really offer the clear route to market that people were looking for. And we consulted earlier this year, in fact, just as the pandemic broke um, on a draft digital health standard, and we got a good bit of feedback for that and MedCity kindly helped collate that. We've listened very carefully to those messages. Um, and what was said very consistently, actually, is that the approach needs to be proportionate and provide an appropriate benchmark for innovators in the healthcare ecosystem to be able to use. And it needs to be as simple as possible. Um, so we've taken that on board. Um, sorry, next slide, please, Kieran. Um, and we will be uh, publishing a more focused criteria for the assessment of digital health services later on this month. And we'll publish that on the NHSX website. And it covers the assessment criteria for the critical elements um, and those that can be measured completely objectively. That's clinical safety, regulatory compliance, technical assurance, data protection, usability and accessibility. And we'll be publishing a roadmap detailing the process when it will be open for different types of products. We're also staying really close to the really interesting looking developing work of the ICO, the International uh, Organization for Standardization, um, uh, because we're very keen to link to international standards where we can. Um, and um, next please Kieran if you'd like to know more about this aspect there is also a workshop on this topic too. Um, a number of benefits I won't go through each of them because time um, doesn't really allow but we do believe that this is a much more effective way um, of opening up the marketplace. Um, we will continue to um, uh, to um, surface patient facing apps on the NHS app store, but we're also looking to get them right into the condition pages on nhs.uk. That's where the very high volume of inquiries come from. And we think if we promote digital alternatives there, that will be super helpful. Um, digital innovators will need to demonstrate they can 
meet the criteria, they may do that themselves, or they could seek support from commercially available app assessment organisations to help. And then evidence will be assessed by subject experts and will provide the final tick off. And the NHS digital process will come to a close as planned at the end of September. Then moving finally to robotic process automation. So this is all about um, opportunities for automating back end tasks, patient registration, finances, HR, and starting to move into areas of helping clinical operations too. Um, you may have seen um, Maddy uh, in our team did a fantastic recent blog on this. Um, and as part of this work, we want to really understand both the strengths uh, in the system and the opportunities and barriers to adoption uh, in health and social care of RPA. So please complete our survey. Uh, it runs till Monday the 5th of October. Um, and we're also um, gathering case studies. So if you're a great example of RPA in action, please do share yours with us at the feedback email address that we uh, commonly use. Um, I'll stop there, given, given time, but that's just a bit of a canter through really some of the four of the big areas um, that we've been uh, working on with the latest updates for you. Thank you.